Thank you, Irvin. It's very nice to welcome you all here to this section of the conference. And what I hope will become clear through the presentation of these three men in diverse ways, that musical sketching is quite different from sketching in the visual arts. Um, let me just name one way in which it is different, and I'll let the speakers tell you some other ways. But one obvious way in which a sketch, musical sketch is different is you can't sell a musical sketch. <laughs> that is to say, you could sell it to a library as an autograph, but you can't sell it as a work of art. A constable sketch, on the other hand, as Mr. Constable has pointed out, are some of his very best works of art. Nobody pretends that Beethoven's sketches are his greatest works of art, and nobody will buy them as that. And there are other reasons, other ways in which musical sketching differs from, from uh, visual, uh, visual arts. And also, uh, I'm sure that the uh, differences came out between literature and the visual arts. And this evening, we will get uh, still another possibility when Twyla Thought talks about sketching in, uh, in the dance. But now we're talking about sketching in music, and we have three people who are equally accomplished at reading, what we might call reading sketches. And in one person, the last one to, to appear, uh, at least we hope he will appear, he's still on, on his way, uh, in the creating of sketches. The first, our first speaker is Leo Treitler, who has recently retired from City University of New York. Um, Leo, after receiving his bachelor uh, and, and uh, master's at, at Harvard, uh, came to Princeton where he received a PhD. Um, he is primarily a musicologist, but he had training in composition, very good training in composition, I may say, and uh, therefore knows uh, the subject from in, inside out. Uh, his specialties as a historian have included the middle, in the middle Ages and the Early Renaissance, but also he has edited a Bach cantata, he has done important work on Berg and Bartok, and he is particularly interested in criticism and theory. Let me give you the title of, of an important book of his, which will give you an idea of the way his interests lie. It's called Music and the Historical Imagination. So when he comes to us to talk now on writing music, sketching music, he's talking from the point of view of one who has done his own writing and sketching, who has studied a great deal of writing and sketching, and particularly can give us the background of writing music from the very beginnings of musical notation up to the present, and uh, we'll have some very interesting things to say, I'm sure, on the question of what a musical composition really consists, consists of when uh, there is no adequate notation to take care of it. Leo? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you hear me if I'm away from this microphone? Thank you very much, Ed. Um, I'm going to start here, and then I'll move over to there, because I have to, uh, a lot of uh, um, transparencies to show. <clears throat> I'm going to begin by addressing head-on the question that Irving Levin asked me yesterday at lunch. In the sense of the narrative spine of this conference, uh, as it has been um, developing, I suppose that we catch our first glimpse of musical sketching uh, in a few uh, compositional tables made by Renaissance composers, and we can follow some such practices into modern times, for example, to Alban Berg's tables of tone row permutations made during the composition of Lulu. We'll soon hear from the next speaker, uh, Louis Lockwood, um, uh, learn a great deal about the most uh, prodigious sketcher in this history, of course, 
uh, Beethoven. But I have in mind a broader or looser sense of sketching, and in that sense I would say the practice began with the beginning of music writing in the medieval West. That's not self-evident, and I must try to say what I mean first by way of describing my particular interest in our general subject. It is in the whole matter of the symbolization of music through writing, in the translation, transformation, transport, transmission of mental musical images, ideas, forms, conceptions, into and through signs made on paper, vellum, parchment, whatever. I came to this interest through the study of the oldest Western music uh, that we can know, the music of the Western Christian Church. We know that music first from books with musical notation dating to circa 900 AD and after. But of the thousands of religious and liturgical songs somehow represented in such books, most were sung during several, several hundred years before the books were made. It is that rich oral tradition itself that had engaged me first, but that interest led me inevitably to puzzle over the writing down itself, over the sudden urge and the sudden invention of the means to do so, invention of a writing technology that is uh, our window to the oral tradition, and to puzzle about its, how its symbols worked for the people who made them, how they used them. From that perspective, I came to be in awe of something that we take for granted when we write or read a musical score, and to regard it uh, as um, always under the aspect of its mysteriousness, however much we may understand about it. Making graphic representations or reductions of and then reconstituting from them what? Music? Forgive me if I ask, what is music? I mean, in the sense, what is it that has been represented by musical notation and reconstituted from it? Some idea about that question must be embedded in talk about sketching music. Posing the question of ontology could serve as a kind of switch, shunting us into the domain of the philosophy of music, I'll let that happen, but stay only briefly, and then veer back into the domain of music history. My Cicero for this brief excursion will be Goethe. Worthy sketches by, I'm quoting, worthy sketches by great masters, he's talking about uh, visual artists, of course, these bewitching hieroglyphs are most responsible for the love of art. Here, it is not a matter of drawing, proportion, character, expression, composition, harmony, finish, but rather of a sign for all of those which appears in their place. Der Geist spricht zum Geiste, mind speaks to mind. I'm drawn to this passage first by Goethe's choice of the word hieroglyphs, which speaks of the secret and the enigmatic. I think that musical notation is always enigmatic. And then I'm drawn by the last sentence, Der Geist spricht zum Geiste. Goethe incorporated both thoughts in another passage about artist sketches. Quoting again, a happy inspiration, halfway understandable and only as it were symbolically represented, flashes through the eye, stirs up the spirit, the wit, the imagination, and the art lover, taken by surprise, sees what is not there. The ideas so vividly expressed in these passages, recognizable more obviously in the experience of apprehending the sketches of masters of the visual arts, but ultimately in the sketching and writing of music, were given abstract philosophical expression about two centuries later, and with specific reference to music, by the phenomenologist Roman Ingarden in his book, The Work of Music and the Problem of Its Identity, which appeared in the original Polish in 1958 and in English in 1986. I have to be very brief about this. Ingarden's reasoning led him to the conception of the work of music as a schematic construct with areas of indeterminacy, aspects of the sound base that are not fixed and therefore not specified in case there is a score, and whose determinate and indeterminate aspects both are dependent for their concretization on acts of consciousness by their makers and apprehenders. The work's mode of existence is thus heteronymous intersubjective. It is an intentional object. 
Der Geist spricht zum Geiste. The importance of Ingarden's emphasis on the notion of the musical work as a schematic construct can be easily overlooked. So I want to pause over its implications for the relations of notational patterns, sound patterns, and musical work. They were spelled out in a provocative essay by Benjamin Boritz with the title, Nelson Goodman's Languages of Art from a Musical Point of View, from which I quote, Sounds, then, are not part of music, however essential they are to its transmission. And neither are paint, pigment, or canvas parts of paintings. Sounds, in fact, are not even what musical notation specifies. What scores do specify is information about music structural components, such as pitches, relative attack times, relative durations, and whatever other quali-categorical information is functionally relevant. It is sound successions rather than notations that are the real symbolic languages of music. And notes require prior music structural interpretation to be regarded as music determinately symbolic of sounds. I'll restate what is for me the essential line of this in terms of a chain of symbolic relations. What notations symbolize are properties of notes that symbolize sound successions that symbolize musical structures. And notes, in order to play that role, require functional interpretation. For example, not just that this is a B natural, but that it is a leading tone that implies an eventual move to C. And that process of implication and realization will determine some aspect of the action of the piece. Or it could be that this B natural against the C in another voice expresses the grief of which the words of the composition speak. Now I would like to show something of how Ingarden's conception resonates with the perspective I have gained from my studies about the writing down of the oral traditions of early Western music. But first I have to say that I read his word work in the general sense of the musical object or composition, not in the narrow historical sense of the work concept to put it briefly, the concept of the closed, unified, and fixed work, uniquely identified by its score and performance, that has informed our music concept since around 1800. The concept of preparatory sketch is really a dependency of this work concept in most usage, as in talk of sketches for a work, when the work in that sense is a backdrop for the analysis. And in that dictionary definitions of sketch identify these attributes, rough, preliminary, open, tentative, brief, slight, superficial, and hastily done, all opposites of the properties of finished works. What I'm really asking here is whether we could have such a concept of sketch without such a concept of work. Ed, do you mind if I just move over here? I'm sorry, I'll move your chair. How's this? Fine. The story of the beginning of music writing in the ninth century is complex. With some oversimplification, it can be told in terms of two projects. First, the provision of signs exactly representing the elements of tone systems for illustration of explanations in theoretical writing of which the European tradition began, in fact, in the ninth century, and in which the explanation of the tone system underlying the musical practice was one of the main tasks. And second, the introduction of a system of diacritical signs for the written words of traditional songs whose utility was directly or indirectly related to their performance. The first was really a revival of an ancient Greek discipline, even employing at times an ingenious but cumbersome system of music writing adopted from the Greeks. The second was a true innovation in every regard, and our notational system descends from it directly. The diacritical marks were derived from prosodic accents uh, and punctuation signs and shared the functions of both, indicating upward and downward movements of the voice and marking the syntactic groupings of the sung texts. In addition, they were provided with marks indicating various aspects of the performance, production of word sounds, voice production, duration, pitch inflection. On the other hand, this system did not initially include any indication of relative pitch or interval size. 
if it was related to performance at all, it can only have been as mnemonic and guide in a continuing oral tradition. Its invention can be pinpointed to a period of about 50 years, between about 780 and about 830. And by about 900, the enormous extant repertory of chants for the Western Church had been notated with it. It is hard to say which is the more awe-inspiring, the extraordinary memory feat of the oral practice or the cognitive achievement of conceiving that it could be represented graphically, of inventing a system for doing so, and, it, and then encoding it by means of that system. To encourage some appreciation of the ambitiousness of the translation, I show you an extreme case of detailed representation, a line of neumes from a trope, a poetic and melodic expansion of a traditional liturgical chant in a book written at the monastery of St. Gallen in Switzerland. The transcription below the neumes in modern notation uh, is based on a later source that does incorporate information about relative pitch, as this one does not. To the information encoded in the neumes is added information symbolized by letters of the alphabet. At number one is the letter L, levare, lift the tone. At four is the letter T, trahere, draw out the tone, or perhaps tenere, hold it. At eight is the letter S, sursum, upward. At 11 is the letter E, equaliter, the note following the letter is the same as the one preceding it. Now, from our vantage point, we might easily see this as a set of highly precise instructions for performance. But there are considerations um, that uh, suggest to me rather an intention to provide a detailed and accurate representation of singing in accordance with values established in the Carolingian uh, culture. I wish that I had time to spell out uh, these considerations, but I just don't. Um, I posit a relationship between score and music not of direct dependence, but of parallel existence and independent valuation. To encourage some appreciation of the difficulties that could be encountered in carrying out the task, I show you a picture of the notation of a communion chant classified as third mode on E in two books, one written in St. Gallen, A, the other in northern France, uh, B. The signification of neumes, uh, of the neumes is identical. The differences that you see are just differences of regional scripts. Both notations are of the earliest kind that specify direction of the voice movement and grouping of the notes in relation to the syllables of words, but not relative pitch or interval size. When later notators, using a notation that encoded that information, came to write out the melody, they ran up against an unsuspected new problem. The addition of pitch information worked a fundamental change in the reference of the notation from melodies to a tone system. Here's what happens when the melody uh, is written uh, in our notation system. The version on the lower half of the page is a direct transcription from a manuscript with pitch information. The version in the upper half is transposed back from that back to E, which we have to understand to be its original tonality. The problem is that the tone system at their disposal, uh, at the disposal of these uh, uh, writers, did not have an F sharp, not to mention the possibility of alternating F sharp and F natural. Different notators tried different solutions. The simplest was to transpose the whole melody to A, as in the lower half of this transparency, making use of the B-flat that was in the system. Others recomposed the troublesome part of the chant, that I've shown here, 
keeping it in E, but eliminating the F-sharp, F-natural problem. Three versions here. The point is that the capture in graphic form of musical ideas that had existed only as intentional objects in an oral tradition was a struggle initially. And sometimes musical ideas required taming before they could be um, subjected to the discipline of a notational system. In a way, it could be said that taming music was one of the functions of writing it down. Notation is among the controls on the chaos into which music always threatens to erupt, carrying us with it to cite a fear that has been persistently expressed in writing about music as far back as we can follow it. We find this link between order and music writing in a passage in Johann Nicolas Forkel's Allgemeine Geschichte der Musik, General History of Music, of 1788. Forkel reported that travelers in distant places populated by wild and uncultivated people could not write down the music of such people because, as he explained, their music was too incoherent to be written down. We get something of that idea a hundred years later, I believe, in Gustav Notterbaum's reading in Beethoven's sketches, the pathos of the composer's struggle with his demon, his wrestling with his own genius. Indeed, I have wondered sometimes whether the sketches do not also seem to show just such a struggle to find a way of writing down the ideas that were generated in Beethoven's mind. For the composer and pianist Ferruccio Busoni, the success of music writing in this struggle was neither so clear nor altogether a gain. In his Entwurf einer neue Ästhetik der Tonkunst, sketch, we can say, of a new aesthetic of musical art, he wrote the following. Notation is itself the transcription of an abstract idea. The moment the pen takes possession of it, the thought loses its original form. Even if much of the idea is original and indestructible and continues to exist, this will be pressed down from the moment of decision into a type belonging to a class. The performance of a work is also a transcription, and this too, however free the performance may be, can never do away with the original. For the musical work of art exists whole and intact before it is sounded and after the sound is finished. It is, at the same time, in and outside of time. This passage resonates with a letter that Schiller wrote to Goethe in 1801 and uh, that I've decided to read now, especially uh, after Frank Gehry's presentation to this conference yesterday. Quoting, the poet must think himself fortunate if through the clearest consciousness of his operations he comes only so far that he still finds the first dark total idea of his work unweakened or undiminished in the completed work, without such a dark but powerful total idea which precedes everything technical, no poetic work can arise. The discipline that music writing has been held to impose is an aesthetic principle, and one that had no currency or authority during the first three centuries or so of music writing. There was, however, a political principle at work during those centuries that could seem to come to the same thing, but it affected only one type of music, the traditional chance for the mass and office, the vast majority of which had been in use at least a century before they were written down in any form. The ecclesiastical and imperial politics of the dominions required uniformity in accordance with what were uh, believed to be their Roman originals. But beyond that repertory, there was no effort to enforce such a principle. That is evident from the presentations I now show you from five Italian books of the 11th century of a line from an Easter trope on the left side of this, whoops, on the left side of this transparency. What is represented is a constellation embodying an aggregate of essential musical ideas, themes, motives, relationships that mark its identity. These ever-present elements reveal, are transparent to, an archetype that is given concrete expression. But the archetype is tacit and formless. I mean archetype to refer to knowledge that we have, by vir or that they had, by virtue of its embeddedness as a condition of mental life, in a way a Jungian conception of archetype. 
access to it is gained through some kind of transformation in an ongoing productive process, resulting through different associations and intersections and stylistic emphases in different local or individual variations, which I call sketches. I intend the connotation of the ephemeral in that word because it emphasizes the continuity of the process and because in its very ephemerality, the sketch comes nearest to the mental ideas that are held tacitly and whose embodiment is the unfolding of the song. Th that is its aim, in contrast to the autonomous and closed work. Just as the sketch is ephemeral, so the archetype has a timelessness about it. That is an aspect of their relationship. It means that in that tradition, the constellation is always being produced, always being practiced. Each text is a documentation of the continuing practice, but such sketches could emerge could be improvised at moments in which they were called for by the ritual or social occasion, whether or not they were deposited in books. The creative process could be productive, whether or not the products were written down. That is a point of fundamental importance for our understanding of musical creativity during this central era of the Middle Ages. As it happens, musicians of this time did have reasons to try to make textual representations of the archetypes that underlay their productions in compilations that are called tonaria, toneries. In this time, the ritual music of the church was classified into eight modes for a number of practical reasons, and the tonaria were in effect the catalogs in which the chants were listed according to their modal class assignments. But as one way of distinguishing the classes according to the melodic properties that were proper to them, model melodies were written out for each mode. They wrote out two such melodies for each mode, one with nonsense syllables that are vowel-rich and thus especially singable, like E-I-E-I-O in Old MacDonald Had a Farm, the other with words from biblical texts that include the number of the respective modes. Transparency of right, um, shows the two model melodies for the mode of the tunes uh, on the left side from six different tonaria, that is, mode two. And I hope that you can see the resemblance among them and between them and the melodies in the preceding example. At the Reina Sofia Museum of Modern Art in Madrid, there is just now a special exhibit called Picasso, the Great Series, in which I've seen something parallel to what I've just shown you about musical creativity and sketching in the Middle Ages. The show encompasses four constellations of paintings, each set a series of takeoffs, one on Delacroix's painting Les Femmes d'Alger, another on Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'Herbe, um, a third on Velázquez's uh, Las Menenas, and a fourth on Picasso's studio in his house in Cannes, Le Californie. Even if the paintings hadn't been dated, as they are, showing that each was made within a single day, one could see the haste with which they were painted, the absence of any sign of editing, the urgency of capturing on canvas the mental image of the moment, obviously had priority over any aim for finish. It seems to me that no other artist so vivifies Walter, Walter Benjamin's dictum that, and I quote, the finished work is the death mask of the inspiration. But of course, only in some of his work. That quality of instantaneity was the commanding impression at the show, rather than the thought of the virtuosity that made such speed possible. The speed, again, gives the impression of being at the boundaries of the mental image and its concrete representation. And beyond the figurative elements of the model that one recognizes in the paintings of each series, one recognizes in all of them the gestures and transformations that are Picasso's own. Altogether, each constellation comes off as a series of improvisations, variations, sketches, but sketches after, not for, a finished work. One last demonstration to thicken the, miss, the mix. Frédéric Chopin, once settled in Paris in 1831, published his music with houses there, in Germany, and in England. His usual practice was to send autographs in his own hand always, to all three publishers. 
For the Nocturne in A-flat, opus 62, number one, he sent off three autograph scores on the same day in August of 1846. The transparency shows measures 53 to 55 of that piece, a harmonically enriched reprise of the kind that Chopin usually turned out as purple passages. In six versions that we can compare, a sketch, which you see on the upper two staves, the autograph material prepared for the edition of Brandus, the uh, Paris publisher, which includes actually three vers versions of the passage, the next five staves. The autograph prepared for the German Breitkopf edition, which has one variant from the edition, as well as from the Brandus autograph, and the first three editions, the lower five staves. The English uh, Wessel edition, for which Chopin's autograph has not survived, is identical to the German edition of these measures. Pianists looking for guidance to the authentic version will not find it here. But if I play all the versions, I think that you will hear them as unfoldings of the same underlying harmonic and melodic sweep, a relationship like that among the trope melodies and their underlying archetypes. And I wonder whether there is not a temptation to regard all of the versions as sketches. This is what is identified as the sketch. Ah, sorry. And here's the first version, the first Brandus version. And the second Brandus version. third Brandus version. And the Breitkopf and Wessel editions. the Brandus edition. This situation generalizes for Chopin. The score seems not to have been the ultimate touchstone of the work for him. He did not always copy it faithfully when he needed copies. He seems not to have minded having different versions of pieces in circulation. He did not act as though the process of composition had a terminal point. This is evident from such comparisons as the one I've shown you, as well as from uh, presentation copies that he made after the publication of the work and from alterations that he made in the published scores of his music being used by his piano pupils. The fluidity of the music's ontological condition carried over into the performance tradition, for which there is abundant uh, evidence in recordings of Chopin's music made from the beginning of the 20th century into the 1930s, even by pianists with the strongest reputations for fastidiousness, such as Josef Hoffmann and Sergei Rachmaninoff. The appreciation 
of musical sketches in the sense in which their study has been a subdiscipline of musicology is obviously much more private, autonomous, and arcane an occupation than the appreciation of the sketches of visual artists can be. But if this conference is to produce, in the end, a survey and understanding of the phenomenon of sketching and sketches in a broader sense as an aspect of artistic creativity, then we should not fail to take cognizance of musical economies that favor effects like those of visual sketches. For example, the taste in the Romantic era for music given names like impromptu, caprice, capriccio, moment musical, fantasy, kinderszenen, flourishing around the very time that the musical masterwork was held up as the highest achievement of the composer's art. And we should, I think, keep open the question, what is it that sketches represent in view of the hieroglyphic character of musical notation? Thank you. <laughs>